Hi, this is Danielle Carissa from the Jaws Curator, and this is On the Case, Investigating Artsy Issues. In today's episode, I want to expose a few of my own secrets. Don't worry, I haven't done anything illegal or, you know, there's no murder or intrigue like that. But a bunch of you wonderful people out there have reached out with questions about me and my journey as an author. Um, there have been so many really interesting questions and insights that I think are worth um talking about and sharing because I think it could help other people. Uh, before I dive into that though, I have to remember to tell you because I always forget this part <laughs> that if you are listening to this podcast um, from wherever you get your podcasts, you can also now watch this podcast on YouTube. So yes, um, I am facing my fears of seeing myself on video don't enjoy it. But um, if you pop over to youtube.com slash the jealous curator, you can watch this episode right there. Um, and that is where all of the show notes are too. Okay, so first up in today's case file, I have recently realized that aside from a few personal conversations, either at events or through my DMs, I have never really explained why I made the change from writing grown-up books for artists to writing artsy books for kids. Um, so we're going to get to that as well. Uh, number two, there are a lot of little Easter eggs in both of my kids' books that I want to be sure to show you um, in case you've never had any of the readings. How are you going to know about those fun little things? So I will tell you today. Three, there are a lot of you artists out there who are quite surprised that I actually got to illustrate these books, not just write them. And that is pretty rare. And I am so thrilled that um, my publisher, Prestel, they're part of Penguin Random House, they actually let me do the illustrations. Um, I pitched that idea, crossed my fingers, and luckily they said yes. So I'm going to give you a peek into how I made some of the artwork. Um, some of it's analog, then I brought things onto the computer and then brought them back off. So anyway, I'm going to show you all the behind scenes there. And four, I thought it might be helpful to some of you who are thinking about writing your own book, either um, for adults or kids or both, um, to hear how I got into the world of publishing. Um, I know there are a bazillion ways that you can get into it. So um, I'm just going to share my story and the experiences I had. And um, hopefully that will help you with the journey you want to be on. Okay, so first up, why did I change lanes from adult books to kids books? That said, I actually have no problem veering back into the adult lane at some point in the not so distant future. But um, for right now, it felt really, really important to me to write kids' books, and this is why. So for all of my books, I always try, and my artwork too, actually, I always try and listen to the universe because there are themes that come up. There's patterns in the conversations that you're having and the people that you're meeting and I really try and pay attention to those because they always lead to the next idea. So um, a few years ago, I had written my fifth adult book and I was doing the book tour for it for um, a big important art book, Now With Women. And when I was signing the books, I always chat with people when I'm signing. And the pattern that emerged that on that tour was that like literally, I cannot tell you how many people in the hundreds, if not more, said that when they were a kid, and it was always when they were six, seven, or eight, sort of like first, second, third grade, they had been told that they couldn't be an artist. Uh, sometimes it's from a teacher. Sometimes it was from a well-meaning parent. Sometimes, um, you know, it can come from anywhere, a grandparent, another kid, whatever, um, that they either weren't good enough to be an artist or that art was just a fun hobby, but it wouldn't, it could never be a job or um, 
a, a bazillion trillion terrible things that these people had heard. Um, and so I didn't have that experience growing up when I was a kid, I was so supported by my friends and family and my teachers. And I sort of was that art kid that would draw Garfield and Care Bears for people. I completely just aged myself, but I don't care. I can still draw a mean Care Bear. Anywho, um, so <laughs> I was that kid. And then um, I, I don't know, I, it never occurred to me that people weren't supported when they were kids, but wow. I mean, I'm sure there's people listening right now who are nodding along going, yeah, I had a terrible first grade teacher that said, blah. So anyway, I just started listening for these stories and um, there were so many that I thought, okay, my adult books are sort of geared at people, you know, from their 20s to their 90s about how to jumpstart creativity, how to get past blocks, how to um, silence your inner critic, um, how to start making art maybe after a really long hiatus of not being creative. Um, uh, that was my case. And I thought, oh my gosh, there's all these people that have this really similar story from childhood. And I thought, well, I could write another grown up book to jumpstart them <laughs> in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Or I could sneak around to the front of this problem and talk to people when they are, in fact, six, seven, or eight, and plant the ideas that you can do whatever you want. And if you st if you want to be an artist, if you want to be creative, you can, no matter what anyone has to say, whether that is an actual person saying it, or if it is your inner critic has piped up at an early age and is saying it. Um, because I didn't meet my inner critic until I was in my last year of art school. And oh, I will tell that story too, although most of you probably know it, but um, I didn't find mine until then. And it really, it knocked me on my ass. And I did not make art for about close to 20 years. But I have a feeling that if I had had a book like um, one of these that I've written two now, How to Spot an Artist and Art and Joy, Best Friends Forever. If I had read those books over and over and over as a little kid, I think when I got to a moment in art school where I was told, quote, you should never paint again by my painting professor right before I graduated as a painting major. Anyway, um, I think that if I had had these seeds planted in my head when I was little, that maybe when, when that art school moment came upon me, it wouldn't have affected me the way that it did. Um, hopefully I would have recognized you know, my inner critic, my art bully showing up and shutting me down. And I could have handled the whole thing differently. So that is my goal. That is why I really wanted to write these books. I really, I mean, it was so painful <laughs> going through what I went through. And it's just like, so I've been writing these grown up books to help jumpstart people, because that's what I needed once I was an adult. But I think that if we can plant these ideas in kids' heads when they're little, that they can continue to be creative any way they like, whether whether they're told they can or can't. Um, hopefully we can avoid the whole jumpstarting creativity extravaganza as adults because hopefully we never would have stopped. Um, so yeah, I'm super passionate about this because um, it when you hear those stories from people, and they still have tears in their eyes, you know, in their 50s or 60s, when they're telling you these stories from childhood, where they just felt so defeated. And like, how heartbreaking is that? No kid should feel like they can't make stuff. One of my favorite, well, it's not favorite, it's a terrible word, because it's a sad story. But um, I just included it in my recent TEDx talk, which I'm going to give you a link to later. It's so scary. Anyway, um, this woman told me I, she was probably in her 50s and she said she had just started seriously making art again um, for the first time since she was about nine, because when she was in the fourth grade, she was quite an artsy kid, it sounds like, and um, was drawing all the time. And they were um, the teacher asked them to draw a bear. So most of the kids drew the bear from the side, like a silhouette of a bear. But she 
was super, super clever. And she drew a bear from the back. So it's bum <laughs> walking away into the forest, which is really the best view of a bear, if we're being honest. So she drew it walking away. And her teacher came over and picked up the drawing. And in front of all of her classmates, the teacher ripped it in half and said that her drawing was wrong and that she had to redo it. And she said after that, she never really made art again. Like, of course, she would do assignments when she had them in school, but she said she never had the confidence to do anything sort of outside the box, outside the assignment, because she was afraid of it being, quote unquote, wrong. I think that might have been the story that was like, oh, OK, I I have to <laughs> I have to do something about this um, because that's just bullshit. <laughs> And, you know, whenever I talk to teachers, so many teachers are aware of their power and, um, but some aren't. And granted, this was a long time ago and I hope that this does not happen anymore and that teachers don't say these things, but you know, they might. And sometimes parents say these things because they're terrified of their children being starving artists. So they gear them away from art and creative endeavors to something that will pay the bills. Like maybe you should focus on science and math and become an accountant or, you know, a doctor, something reliable where I know that you will be able to buy food and pay your mortgage. <laughs> and which fair enough, but like, there's lots of ways you can do that being a creative person. And I think stamping that out young really makes no sense and it breaks my heart um okay so I want to show you guys is this going to be backwards oh no I don't think it is so this is how to spot an artist this might get messy this came out in 2020 so that's right whole book tour was canceled very upsetting maybe this guy had something to do with it that's the art bully done with blue uh indigo ink He's a bit of a troublemaker. Um, and then the new book is Art and Joy, Best Friends Forever. But just when you think he's gone, there he is giving a bad review on the back of the book. This book is silly, weird, messy, and wrong. This guy always has an opinion. Anyway, so I just kind of wanted to do a quick flip through. I will not read the whole thing you want me to if you want me to send me a dm or something on instagram and tell me and i will do a live um instagram live reading but in case that's not why you're here today but there they are this is art this is joy oh you guys they're just so cute and yes you guessed it the minute they met they became best friends and one minute later they were making stuff this stuff to be exact. So things go on really well for a while. They make houses for fairies. They make uh, leprechaun um, places, uh, homes until they're gluing ma um, googly eyes onto macaroni and the art bully shows up and says, this is silly and weird. And art is super upset about it. Oh geez, there we go. Art is super upset about it, but Joy is needy even noodles and doesn't even seem to notice. So this is where it all kind of falls apart for Art and does not want to be silly and wrong and messy and slowly starts um, getting very serious and perfect and not really having time for Joy. <laughs> Don't worry. It all works out in the end. Um, but that's sort of the premise of this book. Um, I want to show you a couple of Easter eggs that are in both of them because it's just fun. Okay, so let's see. So first of all, how to spot an artist. The first little Easter egg in this one is that I have a son. He's 16 now, so, you know, we don't really do story time anymore. But... He, um, I really wanted something from him to be in this book because he's my tiny baby and I love him so much. So I got him to draw one of the characters. 
So this, this guy right here, he did this, Charlie did this big blue swoosh and he always adds a little bowler hat onto everything he draws forever. So he's done that since he was tiny. So I said, I assume we're going to need a bowler hat. And he was like, uh, yeah. So um, if you have this book and you read it, you can know Charlie did that. He was probably about 12, 13 when he, 12, 13 when he did that one. And then this is the other page conveniently right here that I wanted to show. This is, you guys, I'm really bad at showing on a screen. Whoa, there we go. This page is for the parents and or grandparents and or whoever reading the book who is concerned that there are no jobs for artists if they're freaking out that their kids are going to starve. I took care of that. I purposely listed all of the jobs and just not even all of them because look, oh dear, I was afraid this would happen. This list is too long and it keeps, just keeps going and going, but we are officially out of room. Too many art jobs. That's for the parents that are worried. Anyway, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I covered that one in this book. Um, and how to spot an artist was all about the fact that Anybody can be an artist that um, they come in, um, no two artists are alike. They come in every size, shape, and color. They can live in great big cities, but they can also live way in the middle of nowhere. Because when I was growing up, it seemed like maybe only, you could only be an artist if you lived in New York City or London or Paris. But you know what? You can be an artist wherever you want. Um, the other thing I hear from people all the time is that they are too old. How many of you are nodding at home? Yes. That is also bullshit. Um, because look, artists can also be any age. This one, for example, is 92 and a half. So now this is the, the Easter egg that leads back to art and joy because that little pom-pom lady, the little 92 year old pom-pom makes an appearance over here too, but not as a character. Um, where is she? Right up there on Joy's pile of stuff that she brings over for making. So that was the really cool thing about being able to actually illustrate both of these books is that I could kind of repurpose the visual vocabulary that I had created for the first book in the second book because I really wanted there to be a, a visual connection. Um, and of course, I had to make sure that Charlie got in this book too because he would be so sad if he didn't. Um, so I found a drawing that he did of our wiener dog, Stella, who has now crossed over the rainbow bridge to wiener dog heaven. But Charlie did this drawing of her when he was six. I mean, come on. And I'm so glad that I kept it because I scanned it in, retraced it and put it into the book. So um, I've got a little bit of Charlie in this book too. Um, this is a page where Art is getting quite frustrated and upset because he has decided that he will now draw the best dog ever. Uh, but the pencil must have been broken because it was not cooperating and he was getting very frustrated. So Joy jumped in added some um, fruity markers to the mix and added some rainbow, uh, some raspberry boots, some blueberry wings and a tiny tangerine hat. But Art was still a little stressed out because he was worried that it was wrong and messy. Anyway, okay, now here's here's the sweetest story. I was kept trying to think how I could do this as a post on Instagram and it's just such a long, it's too hard to explain. So I was like, oh, I have a podcast. I will do it there. So. Okay, if you have How to Spot an Artist, there's a page in the middle that's quite sad. And what leads up to it is if you let an art bully stop you in your tracks and they say, don't show this to anybody. What a mess, that looks weird, just quit. What happens, as we all know, that artists can be just become a quiet, lonely, gray block. The end. Of course, it's not the end. There's so much more. 
But this page was a little bit of a misstep on my part because it goes on from there when it says, quiet, lonely, green block, the end, is the book over? No, just kidding. That's not even close to the end of the story. This problem can get fixed in one simple step. I bet you all know at home what that simple step is. If you've ever been blocked, all you have to do is make stuff. Okay, well, I thought I was a genius for that little trick in the middle of the book. But what I didn't realize was that there was no resolution for this little gray block. Like I should have had him at the very end of the book, like happy and everything was back to good. I have all these other happy artists that are at the back. Everybody's happy. The art bully's long gone. But I never brought that gray block back. Now, I didn't even think about this until the book came out and I got a video, which I'm going to insert here and play for you guys. It is a little boy named Dexter. He was two and a bit. And his mom messaged me and said, what happens to the block? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, my little boy will not go past that page. Poor Dexter wouldn't go past the gray block. He was so sad. Um, I'm going to drop that in right here and play it for you so that you can see um, how sad he was. Ready? Here we go. Give him give him kisses. Hmm? Give him kisses. You can give him kisses to make him feel better. Aww. Can you even? He wanted to give him a kiss. Oh my gosh, I felt terrible. And I was like, oh. So I quickly did an illustration of the block happy and, and with rosy cheeks and everything was okay. And I sent it to her to show Dexter, but it didn't work. <laughs> he was still, he would never go past that page. He wasn't convinced it was the same block maybe. So when I, when I did Art and Joy and I was trying to plan out what the characters might look like, I was like, I need to address this for Dexter. Like I need to handle this situation so art is actually the gray block open he's open and filled with art supplies and everything is great and wonderful so um as this story goes on and he i shouldn't say he they're genderless art and joy but i guess it's implied they um as as things go on and the art really starts getting louder and louder and a lot of people don't notice this. It's so funny. I've read, read the book to a few people and nobody's noticed it unless I point it out, which is why I'm telling you guys. So here he is. He's super getting really frustrated. Nothing's really working. Um, the art bully is in art's head with all these negative thoughts. Um, and so he's, art is now only going to make things that are serious, normal, tidy, and right. You see, he's starting to turn a little bit gray. And as he is going and making everything perfectly perfect and um, things aren't going as perfectly perfect as one might hope, the green is starting to fade. The box is slowly starting to close. And I duplicated the exact same page from How to Spot an Artist. So there he is, closed and sad. But Dexter, who's now four, don't worry, Dexter, you can turn the page and things start getting better as art goes on this journey to get inspired again. And look, there's that green is starting to come back a little bit, cracked open a tiny bit. There's some possibilities. Things are going to be okay. And as it goes on and on and on, ta-da! happy, fill the supplies again, back to a nice liney green and everything from there is gonna be okay because, what did he find? What did Art find? Joy! Together again, do, 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 do. Yeah, so if and when you were ever reading this book, pay attention to that little transformation. That was all done 
for Dexter because, wow, I felt really, really bad that I had uh, tripped up on that. Um, okay, that was a lot of information about images. So why don't I show you the behind the scenes of some of the illustrations? So again, if you are listening to this, it's gonna be hard to see these things. Actually, you will have missed all of that anyway. So hopefully you're over on YouTube. Um, again, youtube.com slash the jealous curator, all one word. And there's um, a little playlist of podcast videos there. So um, I'm gonna try and share my screen. It's always an adventure um, to show you my, um, first my Photoshop files. Actually, you know what? I'm not gonna do that first. I am going to, oh, geez. You guys, what am I doing here? I don't want to share the screen. Oh my God. Okay, never mind. We're gonna have to cut that little blip out. Okay, um, I'm gonna show you first. What I would do is paint big swooshes of colors and splatters and glitter and whatever, just to give myself lots of textures and colors <clears throat> to play from. I knew that I needed grass. I need, needed stuff for um, leprechauns. I needed pickles. Um, so that's one of the sheets. Here's another one. Um, gave myself some washy stuff, some rainbowy things so that I could go in in Photoshop and Illustrator and crop out the shapes that I needed. But I really wanted to do this as true as to being a little kid as possible. So I just made a lot of messes. I poured glitter and I photographed that. So yeah, I made all of these, photographed them and then brought them into um, into Photoshop. So I'm going to show you that. So here we are in Photoshop. I really hope that you're seeing this. Um, so I would photograph like a pile of macaroni and then bring it into Photoshop and cut out around it for what I needed. Here's some of the buttons. I made a little flower garden at the back of the book out of all these buttons. There's the, the art bully. He was just um, an inky swoosh. So I brought him in and cleared away all the white. Um, there were some uh, bunnies, bunny clouds made out of pom-pom. So I actually set this up on a big blue sheet and made myself some bunnies and photographed them and brought them in to Photoshop that way. Um, there's one of the green swoosh swooshes I just showed you. So I came in and I cut it out and made this bits for the dinosaur. Um, so it's a really big combo between um, analog and digital to get all the bits and pieces that I needed. Um, let me quickly take you into Illustrator. Here we go. So here's the whole book. Here's the whole layout. They let me do the whole thing because I think because I'm controlling and crazy maybe, and they thought it would just be easier to let me do the entire thing. So I just laid out the whole thing. So yeah, here's the dinosaur now back in place. Here's the um, butterfly noodles that I photographed. And then I would drop in here and I could go in and in Illustrator, I would draw <clears throat> the antennas and all of the little bits and pieces. And then up above all the layout, I have all the things that I need. So here's <clears throat> the evolution of art to the sad block. And then I could do it in reverse to get him open again. Um, <clears throat> outlines I needed for feathers and crayons and um, lids for mushrooms that then I would take into Photoshop and I would crop from, you know, the painting I had done, red painting with white glitter on it. I would cr use these to crop out the mushroom tops. Here's all the greens that I needed for pickles and watermelons and grass and leaves. So it was a real combination of um, 
a little bit of all my skills um, from my graphic design days and um, all of all of the books I grew up loving were kind of similar, like Leo Leone books. I loved so much. Um, Swimmy was about a little fish. And I just remember being obsessed. I mean, it was a great story. And my mom read it to me again and again. But I was obsessed with the way he did the seaweed because it was doilies, like paper doilies dipped in paint and ink and then pressed onto the paper. And I remember on that page, like not even listening to the story because I was just like, how, how did he do that? I thought it was so beautiful. So when Prestel said that I could illustrate these books, I just, I wanted it to feel like that. Like I wanted it to be a combination of, of paint and glitter and real stuff mixed with um, actually making the illustrations come to life on the page. Okay, so that was my little behind the scenes. And what else did I want to tell you guys? Um, oh yeah, okay. The final chapter of this story. See what I did there? A little book joke. Um, how I got into the publishing world. My, my journey was really not common at all. So, um, but some of the stuff that's happened since is, is information that I can pass on. So the way it happened for me was um, I'd started writing my blog in 2009 uh, every day. I was very consistent. My tone was really consistent. If people came to the Jealous Curator, they knew what they were going to get. And uh, in 2011, I was at Alt Summit. It was in Salt Lake City back then. And I was a speaker. So I was it was the first night and I was at a little speaker dinner thing. And a, an editor from Chronicle Books in San Francisco came up and said, uh, excuse me, are you the Jealous Curator? Which I couldn't believe because nobody ever knew who I was. Um, and I was so new to the whole thing. And I, you know, I said, oh, yes, yes. And she said, oh, I really like the writing on your blog. Have you ever thought about writing a book? And I mean, that was on the bucket list. I was like, um, yes. And she was like, cool, cool. So we kept chatting. And then I saw her later in the weekend and she said, you know, I was going to be in San Francisco for something. And she said, why don't you come by the office and bring a pitch? And I was like, yeah, totally cool, 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 cool. And then went back to my hotel room and Googled uh, how to write a book pitch. Like I had to and I didn't want to, I should have just asked her, but I didn't want to look like I had no idea, but I, I really had no idea. So I had two ideas. Uh, one was sort of a coffee table book. Um, and then the other one was this idea, again, as I said at, off the top, that I always look for patterns. And the pattern that was happening at that moment, it, to me in like 2011, 2012, was that I kept hearing people talk about being blocked. And I had been creatively blocked for about 20 years. But to me, because I'd never shared how I felt about this, I, I was ashamed. I thought I was the only one that was blocked. And to me, being blocked meant you were out of ideas and you needed to quit, partly because of what that professor said to me right before I graduated, that I should never paint again. And I listened. And so... But then I'd been writing The Jealous Curator for a couple of years and I, you know, that kind of forced me to dip my toe back into the art world and I was talking to artists and I would hear people talk about being blocked. But they were working artists, so that they weren't quitting, like they would be blocked, but then they would somehow keep going. And I was like, well, how are you doing that? Because I got blocked and stopped and they were like, oh, no, no, like blocks are just part of how this all goes. And I was like, what? So I pitched a book called Creative Block and I interviewed 50 artists from around the world. This was in my pitch. I want, you know, and it, this is the advice for you guys. The pitch, I thought, oh, do I have to write the whole book and, and take her a whole book in three weeks from now? No, no, no. All they wanted was really like a one or two page PDF that said, here's the idea. Here's what I want to do. And the idea was I would interview 50 artists from around the world with different backgrounds, different mediums, different kinds of training, and ask them all in a Q&A format how they deal with being blocked, what they do to get unblocked, um, if they hear their inner critic, and if and when they do, how do they handle that? And I always joke, I think it's actually in the intro, 
that, you know how they say people that go into psychology are actually trying to figure out their own issues? Yeah, that is why I wanted to write that book. I mean, I kind of didn't even care if one person bought it. I just wanted those answers. I, I, I wanted to understand how to get unblocked and how to put my, my inner critic behind me. And if all of these people, these 50 people that I admired so much who were successful working artists, which was my goal, if they could tell me the secret for how to do that, oh my gosh, that was like worth it right there for me. And um, so I put together this little two page PDF. I think I must have messaged her and said, how much do you want from me? And that's what she said, just, just an overview. So I said what I wanted to do, gave the outline of it would be 50 interviews. Um, I, I included who I thought the target audience would be, um, you know, the age range and sort of the, the stats around the readers I already knew I had that I thought would get something out of this. Um, they basically just want to know what your idea is and where you think it would sell. So I did that and um, I went down and saw her and I showed her both the coffee table book, which was like, you know, 200 of my favorite posts or something. And then this idea. And I said, when I met with her, I am really passionate about this second idea, about this creative block idea, because I've been blocked for almost 20 years. And if I can help other people, even like one other person, not waste 20 years, that would mean so much to me. Um, so it doesn't, and she loved it, but it does not stop there. So what happens is an editor will then take it to all of the editors that, that sort of work there. Um, they have like a weekly or bi-weekly meeting where they all sort of come forward with the ideas they've gotten from different people. And if in that meeting, they thought it was a good idea, it would then go to the board, um, at the publishing house who would then decide yes, let's make an offer or no, we don't think for whatever reason that this will work. So at that stage, I just thought oh, it's an honor being nominated. Like I, I did not think it was going to happen. I was an at-home mom. Um, I'd been writing my blog for a few years. My son was, I think in kindergarten and I spent most of my days packing snacks and going to the park. And then I got a call from Kate Woodrow, this amazing editor at Chronicle, uh, and she said, Danielle, they bought it. We'd like to make you an offer. Oh my God, you guys, I cried and cried. It was just so exciting. So I got to do that book. Um, other books followed from there. Um, that's a whole other story, but it just kind of kept going and going. Um, eventually Kate um, left Chronicle and started her own literary agency. And that was right about the time where I started realizing I probably needed an agent. And if I hadn't met Kate the way that I did, I would have needed an agent right from the get go. So that's my other tip is that my way in was so odd. The way in to publish through a publishing house is usually through a literary agent because they're the ones that have the direct conduit to all the publishing houses. Very often publishing houses won't take submissions um, from anyone other than an agent. Sometimes they have open calls um, and it's worth checking the websites of the um, publishers that you're interested in because every now and then they do have open calls. Um, but more often than that, not, they work with agents. It's just, I think, easier for them to, to vet the work. Um, so when Kate started her um, literary literary agency which is called um, present perfect i'll put their link in the show notes if you want to reach out to them or check them out um, they focus on art books and lifestyle books um, and design that kind of thing and so i stayed with kate and i wrote a few more books and um what's really cool is she was then able to shop it around to other publishing houses um Chronicle had write a first refusal on my next book because they had published my first two. And the next book I pub I I wanted to do was a big important art book now with women. And they passed on that because I think they had other titles, similar like other books coming out that were kind of like that already. So they passed and Kate said, okay, well then we take it to 10 other publishers and let them, you know hopefully fight over it. And so we did, we running press picked it up. And so I got to do that. And 
So all of this was going really well. And then I was signing a big important art book and all of these conversations about being stopped as a child came up. So I went to Kate and I said, I really want to do a kid's book. And we talked about it a lot. And she made some very good points that children's books are very competitive. Uh, I wasn't known for writing children's books. I, I had started making a pretty good name for myself writing artsy adult books and changing lanes could be tricky. Um, so I said, okay. And, and, um, but I could not stop thinking about how to spot an artist. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was, I told my dad about it and he loved it. And he was, I mean, my mom reminded me when I was telling them all about this idea <clears throat> that I had written my first children's book when I was seven under a bush in our front yard <laughs> and I had illustrated it and I had a merchandising plan. There were going to be lunch boxes and thermoses and a Saturday morning cartoon, like the Smurfs. I, like I had the whole thing planned and um, my dad, I'm sure you've heard me talk about my dad. My dad was always like my number one cheerleader. And he was like, you have to do it. You have to do it. And uh, I was like, yeah, I know, but blah, 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 all these things. And and then he died uh, very suddenly from a massive heart attack um, when he was in Jamaica to run a marathon, his 27th marathon, I think. And it, he was just gone. Um, my cheerleader was gone. And it also was a really big wake up call to um, life is short. And I was very unmotivated to do anything after he passed because I just was so sad. But I couldn't stop thinking about this kid's book. And I thought, well, you know what? I don't care if I don't have a publisher. I don't care if this never sees a shelf. I need to make it. And you guys know, like, you know, when you have an idea for like a painting or a collage or a photographic series, whatever it is, you don't always know that there's going to be a show. You don't know that, that someone's going to buy it. You just make it because you have to make it. And so that's kind of how I handled this book. I was just like, I don't, I'm not going to do a two page PDF pitch. I just need to make, I need to write this story. I need to do all of the illustrations and I'm just going to do it like, like I'm planning an, you know, a new series of what, of collages. I'm just going to pretend it's an art project that has to come out of me. And I did it and I loved it so much. And so <laughs> I could hear my dad being like, pitch it, pitch it. And so I emailed Kate and I said, remember that idea I had for a kid's book? And I was like, ah, uh, yeah, it's done. <laughs> and I sent her the PDF of the whole thing done. And she had two little girls. Um, <clears throat> I think they were like five and three at the time or something. And she read it to them and they loved it. And she said, I don't care if it's out of your lane or what, you know, if it's competitive, whatever, let's do it. Let's pitch it. And I think we sold it like within the week um, and Pristel bought it. And I could just feel, I could feel my dad. Like I just, you know, it was so important. Oh, I'm going to cry. No, I'm not going to cry. I'm going to hold it together. Not only was the message of this book so important to me, knowing that it was the last project that I had talked to my dad about and that he was so proud of me for and he thought he thought it was such an important message and couldn't believe that kids weren't supported because he was so supportive of me when I was little that um having this actually happen was um I don't even know like it felt life-changing it was what I'd always wanted for so long um and then it was due to come out and you guessed it 2020 and the whole book tour got canceled. <clears throat> so my dad was gone. Um, <laughs> the, there was no book tour. I had this beautiful book that I was super proud of. So I, you know, I, I, I read it online. I zoomed in children and read it to them. Um, and then, and then I had an idea for a second book, Art and Joy. And at the time, Kate and I were thinking, okay, well, that was fun. I had my foray into children's books. Time to go back to grown-up books and so art and joy I was like should that be a grown-up book and I could not 
again, I could not stop thinking about it as a kid's book. And I just love the idea that art and joy are actual names, like proper names of people, but they're also what we all live for, right? Art and joy and that they need to be together. And the whole idea behind this book was that how many of us have tossed the joy out the window because we get too serious about trying to get into a gallery or trying to sell, 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 or um, trying to get into grad school or finding the collectors. And somewhere in there, that joy, the, the, and it doesn't even need to be silly joy. Like it doesn't even need to be googly eyes. It doesn't need to be glitter, but just the, the thrill of making gets pushed aside by the seriousness of um, being a grown up and being worried about rejection and being worried about money and being worried about all these things that suddenly art is just a gray closed up little box that Dexter wants to kiss and make better. Um, so yes, this kid, this book is for kids, but I thought it was also a really clever way of saying all the things I have said in all of my grown up books in 40 beautifully illustrated pages <laughs> instead of 200 pages. I thought I can say everything that I want like this. And not only can I affect little kids and put these seeds in their head that they can do whatever they want, but I can also talk to all of you. I can talk to grown ups and go, remember how important it is to bring joy back into your creative process. And it is never too late. Joy can come back whenever you say, come on, Joy, I need you back. And so um, that's why I wanted to do this episode today. I really wanted to have a way to say this to a whole bunch of people at one time, instead of in drips and drabs and in DMs and in little interviews here and there or whatever. I wanted to be able to tell all of you guys who I know have been along this journey with me. I know you're all on your own journey and I feel like I've been there for that. And I just, I'm going to cry again. I, I'm not going to cry. You guys, it's getting a little emotional in here. I, I just, this is, I can't express, I'm clearly having problems expressing in words how important all of this is to me. Um, anyway, yeah, it's important and I'm so glad that you're here for it. Um, so if you are interested in doing this kind of thing, a kid's book or a grown up book or whatever, any kind of publishing, there are lots of avenues to do it. What I want you to come away with is two things. One, don't feel like you need to write the entire novel ahead of time before you show it to anybody you, you don't have to you can just have like you know a chapter sample and an overview of what you want to do um but if you're feeling like I did with that first kids book that's just like ah it's just to me this is a creative endeavor and I can't get on to the next project until I get this out of my head then go for it think of it that way just make it um, and, and see what happens. I have lots of wonderful friends who've self-published. That's another way to go too. Um, I'll try and gather up some links from them and put them in the, in the notes too, so that you can do that. As far as finding um, a literary agent, Google, you need to find the right one. Um, even though Kate was my friend and my former editor at Chronicle, I still interviewed I had calls with a few other agents from different cities um, who had expertise in different things because I wanted to make sure that whoever I went with you, they're, they're going to be a team with you and they have to have your back. And like, you know, when I came to her with this finished kids book and she was like, oh my God, I love it. Let's pitch it. You know, that's, you need that cheerleader in your camp. Um, and so it's worth doing the legwork to find the right person who's going to be along for the ride with you all the way. Um, you can Google that, uh, depending on what your book is about. Um, you know, if it's a fiction novel, present perfect would be the wrong agency because they don't do that, but you can just Google it and find it. 
I live in Canada and my agent is in San Francisco. So you don't even have to look in your own country. Just find the right person wherever they are on the planet. Um, as long as they believe in you and what you're doing, then that will be the right person. Um, okay. And if you have more questions about this, you know, feel free to message me or whatever, and I will do my best to point you in the direction that will be most helpful to you. And if I can answer questions, I will. And if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll help, help you find it. Um, okay. So hopefully this behind the scenes investigation felt weird not to have a guest. I felt like I just talked well, I did. I just talked that entire time, but hopefully it was valuable and hopefully it shed some light on what is mattering to me so much right now that this is all I think about these days. Um, I hope this book and makes well, both of the kids books, but this book in particular makes a huge impact um, on artists of all ages, because you guys at the heart of it, we're all, we, all of us are art kids forever, no matter how old we are, right? Right. All right. Well, I am working on our next investigation as we speak. I have guests lined up. I have questions to be answered. Um, if you are wondering how to get your question on the podcast, at the moment, I am only taking them from people who subscribe to my daily art delivery. It is called the No Such Thing as Too Much Art Society. Um, you can sign up for it if you want to, it's $36 a year and you get creative content delivered to directly to your inbox. You don't even have to go to Instagram to find it comes to you every morning. Um, yeah, $36 a year. So it's three bucks a month, less than a crappy latte. Surely you can trade a crappy latte for all of that artsy content and a chance to be able to send your questions in. Um, so to find where to subscribe, it's in my Instagram uh, links in bio. So I'm on Instagram just at the jealous curator, all one word. And I think it's the second or third link in my bio. Um, I'm also going to put it in the YouTube show notes. So if you want to look there, there'll be a direct link, which is easy peasy. Um, again, if you're not already watching on YouTube first, I'm sorry, because you just missed all of those pictures. <laughs> but if you um if you're not over there you can go over there and find everything you need at youtube.com slash the jealous curator um oh and you guys while you're over there ugh, my tedx nashville talk is finally out it was a very scary and thrilling 18 minutes of my life um you get no prompter no speaking notes you have an 18 minute memorized talk and a lot of people staring back at you. <laughs> oh, and did I mention that I was the first speaker of the entire event? Yeah. The other speakers backstage were like, I'm so glad I'm not you. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> but they were, when I came off the stage, they were amazing and hugged me and it was all good. Um, it is a little bit horrifying to watch myself don't enjoy that. But if you would like to watch it, I'm very proud of all the words that I said. Um, I sometimes just, I'll just watch it with my eyes closed. So you can do that too. Anyway, um, it's called um, how to cut creativity out of your life completely. So, you know, if you want to do that, you might want to pop over and watch that. Um, okay. Now, before I go, I should also tell you that um, there are upcoming book date. Uh, no, that's not what it's called book tour dates. So um, I'm going to put this in the show notes too, but just so you are aware, if you live in Vancouver, Canada, I'm going to be there this coming weekend, Saturday, April 1st from 1 till 3 p.m. at Collage Collage, the cutest store in the whole land um, on Main Street. So I will be there. I'm going to do a story time and then we're going to do some crafts because hello, why wouldn't you want to have a craft or noon? Um, the weekend after that, Saturday, April 8th, I will be at Powell's in Portland. And oh, I am so, so, so excited about that. Powell's is like the Mecca for reading your books. I've read grown up books there. I have never read children's books. And I'm very excited about that. And I have to tell you guys, my first event in LA, no kids. Well, one kid. My friend brought her two-year-old nephew and he, he didn't really care about it, but 
no kids came because it was raining and um I don't know people don't leave their house in LA when it rains so my pencil shoes not no children saw my pencil shoes and it was very sad lots of grown-up artists came so that was really nice but um I want grown-up artists and little artists to come so Vancouver and then Portland on the 8th and then I will be in New York on Saturday April 29th at McNally Jackson at their seaport location from 10 30 no that's wrong I will be there at noon Saturday April 29th at noon at McNally Jackson in New York and you guys this is my seventh book do you know that I have never been able to line up a reading event in New York it's tricky if you're not Gwyneth, it's it's tough. But McNally Jackson, thank you, McNally Jackson, for inviting me to come. I am going to be there reading the book, Rain or Shine. New, New Yorkers do care about rain. I hope not. If it's sunny or rainy or whatever, please, please come and make all of my dreams come true. It would make me so happy. All righty. I think I can officially say case closed. Thank you so much for listening to me talk about all of this stuff. I hope there were gems in there for you. I hope you enjoyed the little behind the scenes and the Easter eggs and the sweet little Dexter video. Um, and um, yeah, I just want to thank you all so much for listening and or watching or both, whatever happened. And I will be back in a couple of weeks with a brand new creative case to solve. See you then. Thank you.